There's new evidence on how certain pesticides are having a negative impact on bees. New research from Royal Holloway University of London is linking neonicotinoid decline, uh, or ne neonicotinoids rather, to the decline and deteriorating health of queen bumblebees. Nigel Rain was part of the team that conducted the study. He's a professor in the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Guelph, but just happens to be in Regina for a bumblebee workshop. And uh, he joins me here in studio. Good morning. Good morning. So it seems this is kind of a, a perennial story, right? The decline of, uh, of honeybees and the dangers of neonicotinoids. What, what's new here? What's this research all about? Well, I think what's new here is we're, we're looking at, at wild bees here. So as you've said, there's, there's, there's been a lot of research done on managed honeybees uh, and trying to understand the risks associated with pesticide exposure. We know much, much less about what's going on with wild bees. We worked, or, or my team, including my, my PhD student, Gemma Barron, worked extensively on this with queen bumblebees. And we were concerned because during the, the winter and the spring period, the, the queen is the colony. So that one individual carries the hopes of the, the colony going Going forward and any potential effects of pesticide exposure on those single individuals could be quite important for, for the success of the colony going forward. So how was the research carried out? What did you actually do? Well, Gemma went out into the field and caught a lot of, of queens from four different species that we know in the UK forage on canola, uh, and that might be how they're exposed to these pesticides, and brought them into the lab and exposed them to different dosages of pesticide, and obviously we had the appropriate controls as well, and monitored their feeding rates on artificial nectar, and also looked at their, their, their ovary development rates, so how, how able they are to lay eggs. And in, and in terms of the impacts uh, at the higher level of pesticide exposure, they, the, the, the queens of all of these four species had smaller eggs. So it probably means that they're laying their eggs later in the, in the season. And that could be a problem that they're not getting as much of a march on the season. And that could have ramifications later on for colony development and ultimately the reproduction of those colonies, the new queens they're producing for the following year. Right. And then the concern is pollination, right? Absolutely. So uh, wild bees, uh, uh, they, they account for about one in three mouthfuls of food that we eat. So That's a great way of measuring yeah. it, isn't it? Boy, that drives it home. Yeah, absolutely. So fruits, vegetables, nut production are really reliant on, on pollination services and wild bees are providing those services for free if they're in the landscape. And that's the key question, mm. if they're in the landscape. Yeah. So what are we doing to, to help support those pollinators and, and, and to not cause them harm? Yeah, and specifically what chemicals? I mean, you know, Saskatchewan's a province, of course, where a lot of um, farms use pesticides and so on. What Specifically, what pesticides are we talking about? Well, this research was on, on neonicotinoids, in particular thiamethoxam, which is a widely used seed treatment. Uh, on many field crops. So we, we've been focusing on that and a lot of research has been looking at that, but we also need to have a, a good understanding of what's happening with the other chemistries. But this, when we're talking about pollinator health, it isn't just a pesticide issue. Clearly that's one of many stresses that interact to, to, to lead to impacts on pollinator health that we're certainly seeing here and around the world. Um, habitat simplification, so loss of flowers and nesting sites in, in agricultural land as we become more and more intensive is an issue mm. that we need to think about very carefully. How do we find marginal lands on those farms to, to support pollinators with the flowers that they need? Sometimes it takes a long time for people to accept something. And, you know, you think about climate change, for example, and that wasn't just overnight. People said, oh, there's climate change. And we still have people who don't accept that there's climate change. Where is uh, neonic? in all of that when it comes to widespread acceptance that these are a serious problem? Well, I think it very much depends on who you talk to. But um, from our perspective, from a pollinator health perspective, I think there's, there's increasing evidence that uh, the, 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 there are potential impacts. There are impacts on different aspects of the, the bees. And it's not just about whether or not they're alive or dead. It's about how they function normally, so how their behavior might be affected at low level it long-term exposure, which is the type of exposure we're, we're thinking about with systemic pesticides like neonicotinoids. Um, that's a wider question in terms of policy. So how do you balance the need for using, using these for pest control okay, yeah. versus 
the unintended consequences of harm. And how, um, and how do you? What's the answer to that? Well, I think the answer is, is understanding where these are really valuable for pest control. And, and, and I think that's an open question right now. There's, there's not good data to show that these are always good things to use, that these are always beneficial in terms of controlling pests. Um, there are different threshold models that, that we need to have better information on to, to, to get that balance between using these as effective tools and, uh, and maintaining wider ecosystem functions like pollination. Uh, and I think that's becoming more and more accepted by the farming community. And, and I've had a lot of really good conversations with farmers about this. And I think they're aware of these as issues. Mm -hmm. And it's starting to become more and more common as a, as a conversation when people are making informed choices about pesticide use. And I think that's very, very encouraging. And what about from a broader um, governmental regulation point of view? Where do you come at that? Well, I think the, 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 the regulators are, are starting to consider non-honeybees more and more. Uh, they're currently reviewing the impacts of, uh, of neonicotinoids on bees in Canada. Uh, they've already done one for imidacloprid and started to talk about the risks associated with that. And quite recently, Health Canada have suggested that they want to phase that product out over the next three to five years. Hmm. Thymothoxan that we looked at in this study, they haven't released a review yet. And there's also clothianidin, which is a major compound that's being reviewed. So, so there's, there's, and, and in Ontario, where, where I'm based now, um, there's been there's been restrictions on usage of this on corn and soy, which had reached levels in corn of about 99% treated seed and about 65 in soy. Um, so, whether that's that sort of uh, treatment that's happening before the growing season is is in excess of what what the pest pressures really are, mm. and that that's what the regulation to drive that down by an 80% margin on the the acreage of treated crops from the 2015 levels in in Ontario is really aimed at trying to find that balance so are farmers finding the levels of pests that they need these to control them for uh, or are they being used more widely mm. thanks so much for coming in oh thank you very much for having me on Nigel Rain is a professor in the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of Guelph and he's an expert on bumblebees and just happens to be in Regina for a bumblebee workshop with uh, fellow scientists